uh, uh, 40, uh, oh, sorry, 40. <laughs> um, I was a um, recovery navigator. Uh -huh. so I went from, you know, being a recovery navigator to working in housing and, you know, the, the part about choice, you know, mm -hmm. um, that really kind of changed the, the game for me um, because you do, like I said uh, yesterday, you know, you have these biases thinking that you're helping, but you're really not helping. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then uh, also just the, the, the dynamics of how it's supposed to be structured in the point system, how that works. Um, mm -hmm. That was a huge surprise for me um, because there's a lot of different factors that, you know, you don't take into account when you're, when you're um, actually just doing your job. Right. right. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of companies don't explain that particular part right. uh, in detail. Um, the way that it's explained. And so this, I think that, to be honest, everyone who gets into housing should have this training um, because it, it really sets the, the, the tone in, you know, the bar of where we're supposed to be just as an uh, individual peer. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. I, I appreciate that. No, I, I totally agree. It, it, the more information you have from the beginning, the better you can do your job. And that's, and unfortunately, you know, we're bringing in people to do this work, which is important work, but we need to make sure we're arming you with all the information we can so that you can go out there and do the job the right way. And before you get into bad habits or you start doing stuff because there's no guidance, so you, you figure out what you need to do and do it, whether it's right or wrong, because you got to figure out something. So I, I appreciate that. Huh? I did have a question. Uh, do we get, we get these slides? You're going to get the slides. You're okay. going to get a lot of documentation. We're going to send you documentation. Let me explain what's on my screen now. I'm assuming all of you can see this. We talked about this yesterday when I was talking to you about a, a forum out there that is an easy way to keep track of all of your work. This is the form. It's an Excel spreadsheet, but the great thing is it has everything on it that you, that you can give to the Fidelity reviewers up front and make it easy. Make it easier for yourself, your team to be tracking Who's, who has who on what caseload, where are you at with them? When was the first contact that you had with them? Are they a part of coordinated entry? And all of these boxes have their drop, a lot of them are drop down boxes where you can put the information in. Once you put in information, it, 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 it just does a lot of the work for you. And it's a long spreadsheet, it keeps going. But if you see, it also goes into the different types of housing. You know, what type of housing are they in? Um, it goes into how much income do they get? Because remember, I said you have to figure out for each person how what's their income and how much of their income are they paying for rent? This will do the math for you. You don't even have to do the math. Uh, are there other subsidies? Do you have a lease agreement on file? Is there an HQS on file? This goes into a lot of detail. And if agencies had this and used it, they would be in better shape. Um, so we will try to make sure that you get access to this plus some other documents that are on the pathway drive because the pathway drive has a, you know, people have already been doing this for a while. We don't want you to be um, reinventing the wheel. You know what I mean? If somebody's already done a good example, why not use it? So I am going to uh, share some more with you because I, I'm, I'm, I got you. I got all of these, if all of this information, and I think um, it'll be important to just take a look at 
Um, now I'm going to show you this one. This, can you all see this? Is it big enough for you? I can try to make it a little bit bigger um, if I can. Uh, but this is, all of you should have access to this. It's online. If you go to the SAMHSA website, SAM, if you even just put in a Google search and put in SAMHSA PSH, you, you're going to, you will get a document that has this in it. We're going to, I'm going to make sure it's in your documents that you get from this training. This explains to you everything that I've been talking about. So let's see, let me see if I can go through this a little bit. So you see where it talks about the housing options. And I told you there were three parts of that that you have to pay attention to. This goes through all of that. Let me show, let me share some of the pages with you that I think are the important pages of this document. This is where I think it gets good. Look at this. So remember dimension one is choice of housing, right? You got that. Look at what it says about the choice of housing. Measures the degree of choice offered to tenants. If the program has a range of housing choices sufficient to meet consumer preferences and when an integrated affordable apartment is one housing choice, the score is four. If the program does not have the capacity to offer choice, for example, the program operates one apartment complex and tenants must be in the open apartment, the score is one. Now, we it's laid out here how you get a four. A four for extent to which tenant, tenants choose among types of housing. If they get to choose from a, a, a large amount of choices, that's a four. A 2.5 is limited choice. A one is no choice. It's all laid out. So you can even look at your own program and go, okay, Let's look at our program and see where we would land on this. Are we giving limited choice? In essence, you, if you really pay attention and go through this training, um, and you might have to do it again because you were, a lot of you are new, but once you get this under your belt, what you find out is that you can do your own trying to figure out where you're at on your score and make your own improvements internally. Um, if you look at the second part, uh, do tenants get to choose among multiple units? If yes, it's a four. If no, if they're assigned a unit, it's a one. Is a one the end of the, the end of the line? No. Some places can choose to take a one in this area because they have their own housing and they're really looking at, okay, we have our own housing. We're going to take a one there, but we'll do well in all the other categories. That's the beauty of this model is that we're not saying everybody has to be perfect. What we're saying is understand the model and adapt and make choices based on the model and based on your program. If you look at the extent to which the tenants can wait for the unit of their choice without losing their place on the eligibility lot list, it clearly lays out what's a four, what's a three, what's a two, what's a one. And all you have to do is look at your agency and well and it requires you what you have to think about is what can you what is in writing because just saying you do it is not enough so when you're looking at this fidelity scale and you're looking at your program what you have to think about is 
not only we sh not only should we be saying that we need to be able to show that in our paperwork. So do you have paperwork that that shows this? Do you have paperwork? Do you have, are you noting in the file this information? Or are you somehow keeping track of this somehow? Because it's not just enough to say, yeah, we do that. Think about your documentation. So those are parts of, of choice of housing. There's another little piece of choice of housing, which is this 1.2 way do people get to choose who's going to be living with them? And you notice you get a four if people can choose who they want to live with. Uh, it's a 2.5 if you're giving them a little choice. If you're not giving choice or you don't have the ability to give choice, it's a one. Again, what you're going to do with all of these is get the score for your agency and add all of those scores up and then divide it by the total number of items. It, does that make sense? Am I making sense? I'm assuming that that quiet means you're thinking or, okay, yeah, you're, you're getting that good. So I wanted to do this this with the rest of them because I think it's important to really think about when you're doing this what are you looking for what are you you know why are you going through all of this this to me when I had when I used to have audits and this is not an audit but when I used to have audits when I was running programs Sometimes I would never know what they were going to focus on. Like I would sit there and go, oh, I wonder if they're going to really look at this or what are they going to be looking for? You don't have to guess. Anybody can look at this and know what is being looked at and, and adjust appropriately. But it, to me, that makes your job a lot easier. Let's look at functional separation of housing and services. This is where you have to have the house, the housing services are separate from the, the property management. So those two have to be separate. It tells you on the look at 2.1A, housing management staff have no authority or role in providing social services. That's a four. So that should be easy for a lot of the groups who don't have their own housing, right? This should be an easy one. As long as the property management has no role in services, it's a four. Second one, the service providers have, service providers have no authority to collect rent, enforce lease requirements, uh, initiate evictions as a four. Again, shouldn't be a problem if you're working with private landlords. If you're not working with private landlords, these two get very sticky. And But it's possible to make sure that these two are not crossing over if you are paying attention. Cherie, go ahead. I see your hand raised. Yeah, thank you. So what about if the service provider has, can stop an eviction. Like the landlord is the one that starts the, like, okay, you've got a 10 day notice. Mm -hmm. And then the service provider creates a plan with the resident that the resident's willing to step up to. That is perfectly acceptable and good for you to be doing. Okay. That is not get, that is not overstepping your bounds. That is you advocating for your, your person. Okay. And that is perfectly fine. What we don't want you doing is going over to the building, collecting rent and taking that to the landlord. Uh, we don't want you going into the building, pointing out the lease violations. Basically, the research has told us that people do better when they know, when they feel like their service person is there for them, not there for the property. You know, does that make sense? 
So oh, they want you. they want to see service people just focused on them. If the service person is you know, also talking to them about lease violations, it gets confusing. Are you here to support me or are you here to, to you know, be there for the property manager? We need to keep that really clear for people. Uh, the last one for 2.1C is that we want the, um, we want services staff to be offsite. And that might not always be possible. You might have to, you might have your services in the same building. It's, that's not a, it's not going to hurt your, your agency that much, as long as you're paying attention to trying to get the higher scores in the other categories. So if you get a one on one of these It'll take your score down, but it's not going to put you in jeopardy of not meeting fidelity. It's when you start to miss points in every dimension or points, you know, you get ones in three dimensions that that's a hard one to take. But if you get a one in one dimension and the rest are three to fours, you're great. Look, let's look at decent, safe, and affordable housing. So here, let me just also point out one thing. So on this one, it tells you what you can get the score for. But if you go back to the scale, it tells you the math that you have to do. So right here, it tells you the math of when you, so once you get these scores for all of these, you add these four uh, subsets together and you divide by four to get the average. So it, I, it, it's nice that it gives you that as well. Um, on the safe and affordable housing, basically I told you that yesterday you get Or if, if they dirt in their uh, income for rent, 50%, and anything over 50% is a one. Does that, that make sense, right? And you have to do this for each person. So can you see where that document I showed you would come in handy? Especially if you have large caseloads or you have a large program, it's going to be time consuming to go through every person and do look in the file and find the income and find how much they're paying for rent and do the math. Um, the safety and, and, and quality, again, do the units have an HQS? Uh, if they do, if 100% of the units have an HQS, that, that is a four. If it's 75% of the units meet HQS as a 2.5. If HQS is not met by anybody, it's a one. Lays it out for you. It, it, the, the nice part is you can lay that you can look at this for each staff person and see like, are your, all your staff doing the same quality? Or you can, you can also use this to, to gauge where each staff person is for their, their performance. I, it, you know, just ideas. You can use the, this document in many ways, but you can look at your own program and make decisions about what needs to happen. Housing integration. Housing integration is only one piece of information. And it basically, says are the youth integrated and then it says you know do people live in apartments where zero to 25 percent of the units are set aside for people with uh disabilities what we're trying to do is make sure you're integrating people into the community not putting them in program housing or in housing that was set aside for them because that housing was already there and you know 
So anyway, you can see how, you know, your score will be affected. You, and this should also, you should be also thinking about this when, when you're helping people find housing, you don't want to go to the same landlords all the time. You want to have a mix of landlords so that you can give people choice and you can also not set up a, a, a place where people all have disabilities living in the building. Then we move to dimension five, rights of tenancy. Basically, we want every person who is in permanent supportive housing to have full rights, full legal rights of tenancy. So if people have a lease, you get a four, just, just because you ha people have a lease. If people do not have full legal rights because they either don't have a lease or because they um, are being are going into some type of program, that's going to affect your score. So you need so you basically you do this for every person. So every person on your caseload will either get a four or a one. You should be able to know that. Do you have copies of the leases? If you have copies of everybody's lease, that's, that's one step. And then looking at those leases and making sure that the majority of the people have a regular lease, you're gonna, your score is gonna be higher. If you too many people don't have a lease, then your score is gonna be lower. The next part of rights of tenancy is you know, trying to not force services on people. If you're forcing services on people, we know that the, the research says that people, the, our, our participants don't like that. They don't like when they have to be sober to keep their housing because nobody else has to be sober to keep their housing. If that was the case, many of us would not have housing. Because I tell you, there are many days I go home and have a glass of wine because I've had a rough day. Um, and so each person would get a score of whether or not they have to be compliant with, their, with the program. If you if your agency is set up in a way that people have to be compliant with the services you might get a lower score on this again you need to be thinking about if you're the program manager you need to be thinking huh do we is that okay for them to get a lower score in this or can we improve this can we improve this somewhat um Again, you take the two scores, you add them up, you divide them by two, and that gives you your score for dimension five, which is rights of tenancy. Access to housing. Now, this one, people, I, I need to warn you. And I think I told you this yesterday. We're not just looking at your program on dimension six. Because on dimension six, a lot of times people, you're getting referrals to your program from other agencies. We're also looking at those other agencies to make sure that everybody who comes through that agency has a chance to get into the permanent supportive housing program, regardless of their issues. So what we want to see is we don't want to see, see the first one, if you get a four, if tenants have access to housing with no requirements to demonstrate readiness, that's how you get a four. So that means anytime any person who wants to get in the housing, however your system is set up, if they have to get a referral, from within your agency or a referral from outside of your agency, you need to make sure that the staff who are doing those referrals are referring in 
anybody who says they want housing to your program. Sometimes agencies come back at us and feel like this is not fair because they feel like they're doing everything they can do, but maybe their partner is not doing their, their part. What we come back with is that's your program's responsibility because you've entered into this agreement with this agency. That agency should have to understand that you're trying to get people into your program regardless of what the issues are. There are no housing requirements. And you have to sometimes continually educate your um, educate the people who are doing referrals on that. If there's a new person that comes through to do referrals, I always to make sure I got to the plane what we were trying to do and that they should be referring everybody. Not just people, but to get them to understand every person who looks for themselves be referred to you no matter what. And I make it. Pat, you're cutting in and out a little All bit. All right. So next part of access to. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't. I let me let me. I did get a sign or thing that said my internet was unstable, but I'm not sure what's unstable. Um, am I good now? Yeah, you sound good now. It was just kind of lagging. Okay, I'm, I apologize. Um, let's look at 6.1b. Um, program pro actively seeks tenants who have obstacles to housing stability. All we want to see there is that you're working with people who are the hardest to serve people. And, and that should be a requirement a requirement um, about, you know, what's your capacity and are you, um, and are you able to take the hardest to serve people? If I think that's, that should be fundamental because everybody has to go through your they have to get, they have to be approved before they could be in your program. So that should be an easy one, right? That you're getting the hardest to serve people. Uh, uh, the last part, this is important. And I think a lot of agencies really lose out on this one because it basically says, look, service staff should not be going into anybody's unit. It actually is a legal issue in some cases because I know plenty of staff who are service staff who have keys to the units. My question is why would a service staff person need a, a key to somebody's unit? Anybody have an idea as a service person? Would Why would you need a key to somebody's unit? I do. Sorry, I couldn't get my hand up. Okay. So we, we have, you know, we're supportive housing. So everybody in here comes through is supportive housing. So um, I'm going to lose points on that. But anyways, all my staff have keys in case there's an emergency, such as one of our gentlemen who had uh, seizures on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. He is it just so happened that his unit was above my staff office. And uh -huh. so if they would hear thumping, they would run up and go into his unit because he was having a seizure. They would knock first, but it's used only for emergencies. You need to have really strict guidance on what's considered an emergency mm -hmm. for your staff. I'll tell you what I've, what I've seen is... I've seen some staff use this and, and I, I hadn't heard from the person in a, in a few days. So I, I used the key to go in to make sure they were okay. Sounds like a perfectly reasonable assumption, right? But 
why couldn't they either leave a note for the tenant to say, I need to talk to you? Because it's been a few days. If they haven't seen them in a day, put a note saying, you know, I just want to check in to see how things are going. Can you please contact me? I, I think you just want to be really careful with having staff going into people's units. Um, I'll tell you an incident that I had that made me really think about this and think about it hard. One of my staff decided to go into somebody's unit because they felt like the person might be in harm's way. They went into the unit. The person was not there. They left the unit and said, person's not there, false alarm. That client that lived there called the police and reported that somebody had entered his apartment illegally and he was missing $500. The police came, they arrested my staff person for theft. And the client said, the only way I am going to drop the charges is if I get my $500. I couldn't leave my staff person in jail. So I Pay, the company paid the $500 to get him out. Do I think that the staff person stole money? No, but the staff person was in jail and it didn't matter what, I, what we could prove. It mattered that I had a staff person in jail. Sure. So you, you just, what I'm saying is make sure you have a policy and make sure that it's clearly documented what is considered an emergency and, and how do you, you know, what happens if somebody is not, if somebody goes into somebody's unit and it wasn't an emergency? So we always have to have managers. Manager has to be there and okay. there has to be two people there when okay. they go into. So my staff can't just go in. The one with the seizures, that was a written, like you're having seizures if we hear thumping, is it okay that we go into your unit to make okay. sure you're safe? So that okay. was a specific reason. But any other time, unless there's fire or flood. Right. right? Unless um, there's an emergency. If there's fire or flood, yes. But well checks and stuff like that has to be documented, has to be with the manager. They can't go by themselves. So it's not just staff can go in. Right. It has to go up a level of. Things. Okay, good. And, and that should be documented. And it should be clearly documented and every staff person should be forced to read that and, and understand that that is the limits for them. You know what I'm saying? Because I you, sometimes you have staff that go rogue who are on their own and feel like a decision has to be made and will make a decision, which is what we encourage them to do. But you want to make sure they know the guidelines of where what they can do and what they can't do. In a regular apartment, if somebody were injured or we suspected something was wrong with the person, what usually happens is you contact the landlord and the landlord or somebody that the landlord sends would open the door and go in with you. So it would be two of you going in, one is the landlord, and both of you can vouch for each other. And you have, you that way you don't have one person going in to a unit without somebody else with them. Um, and the landlord legally can open the door to check, to do a well-being check. But even landlords cannot just go into somebody's unit unless it's an emergency. Landlords so I, have to give you notice if they're going to go into your unit unless it's an emergency. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I was a, I mean, I was a landlord for HUD and tax credit for three and a half years. 
Um, and that is something that like we would have supportive housing specialists in the building that had different clients. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if like they couldn't get into a unit or like somebody wasn't answering. Um, I know for me, like landlords, I was always really happy to go up and do mm -hmm. a wellness check with someone and make sure hey, your client's okay or not, or maybe they're not home. Um, there right. are rules on whether we can open a unit or not. Um, exactly. We, we do yes. have to follow the law and sometimes it is better to just call the police. Mm -hmm. um, but I know like in my experience, landlords are more than happy to help um, with a wellness check. So that way, like the supportive housing specialist doesn't have keys. And most landlords also really only want the tenant to have a key anyways. Exactly. I know things are different when services are like on site and there are like different things going on. But just like from that perspective, um, it is important for like the landlord to know who has keys, who mm -hmm. has access and for that access to be legal always. Exactly. And, and it's important because tenants... When tenants sign a lease, also does your lease, you know, does your lease have some something in it that says that staff can go into their units? Because most leases say that, you know, the the landlord or the manager, the property manager could go in to your unit only in case of an emergency or if they give sufficient notice to the tenant. So there are legalities mixed in here too that you need to just be aware of. And you might want to check that lease to make sure that lease gives the staff the right to go into that unit. But in my, in my, in my experience, it was always best for the property manager and only the property manager and a tenant to have the, a key to their unit. And I've had many tenants say, can I give you a key in case I lose mine? My answer is no. What I would recommend is you giving, you finding another way to give somebody the key or you putting the key somewhere that only you know where it is that you have access to it. But I cannot just, I don't want to hold the key. I don't want that responsibility. Because I know the minute that something happens, I'm going to be looked at as, oh, you had a key. You could have gone into my unit. It, it really is about not, it's about keeping your staff safe. Also, it is about uh, legal. I'll tell you another example. I'm, I, I volunteer with this group here in Chicago they are doing permanent supportive housing and they're working with people who are HIV positive or who have AIDS. One of the staff thought they were doing a good thing by they heard a noise in somebody's unit and they rushed the, the service staff went into this unit in the middle of the night to check on this tenant because he had he had some breathing issues and they freaked out for whatever reason and they wanted to go check on him. So they went into his unit in the middle of the night. He thought somebody was breaking in. He pulled out a knife to, to hurt the person who was breaking into his unit. So you really just, I can't emphasize this enough. You need to be clear with your staff on what it is that you want them to be doing and you need to, it needs to be documented. Don't leave it up to, or have this just be something that's word of mouth. Write it up, make sure everybody reads it, make sure everybody understands it and make sure that your staff understand how important this is. Questions? Thank you so much for clarifying. Yes, it, it, it really is something that I, I think, you you know, it's fine to do well-being checks, but you just need to, you don't want to be doing well-being checks for, you know, if somebody's doing well-being checks every day, I'm like, why? You know, do we need to have a different type of plan for this person? Is there a crisis plan in play so we can know, you know, when the this person is in crisis, so we're not just going to their unit every time we suspect something. If does that make sense? Thank 
so does. That, I'm going to have to reevaluate the whole thing, and I'm going to sit with my director and make sure this is a very clear plan and how we implement it. So thank you. Yeah, and sure. and and I say this because I have years of experience, and I told you, it, I have so many examples of stuff that I've learned from that I feel like you know. I was, I'm, I'm naturally a service provider. I've always been a service provider, but I had to learn the property management side because I was working with people in housing. And let me just say, just because you're in services doesn't mean you get to violate a person's rights. And, and that you have to be aware of what those rights are. I had to learn that property managers couldn't just not go into, into a unit. I had to learn what their process for the property managers were and when they could go into a unit and when they could not go into a unit because that affected me and my job. Kimberly, I see your hand up, talk to us. Yeah, I just was gonna <laughs> piggyback on this. You know, this also goes back to choice and whether a participant may or may not want to mm -hmm. engage with you that day. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we see policies out there where, well, we haven't seen them in 48 hours, we go do a safety check. And so we want to remind folks that sometimes participants just don't feel like engaging with us. And so maybe you don't see us or maybe they don't answer their door for us because they just don't, they choose not to. And we have to allow them some room to do that. And so again, having that agreed upon you know, this is when you would want me to come into your unit as opposed to, you know, if, if we were going to do a health and safety check, do we have an agreed upon thing with that participant mm -hmm. saying that this is the point where we would be able to do that? Because uh -huh. again, we want to offer choice and allow them to have space to not engage with us if that's what they're choosing to do. Mm -hmm. We, of course, want them to, but we can't just automatically go in their unit when they don't. So there's there's policies that we see out there that kind of look at that. So if you need help looking over some of your policies or want to discuss those, Rayanne and I would be happy to sit with you and talk those through and how we can, how it can fit into Fidelity. Thank you. Donna, I see your hand up. Talk to me. Yes. And I think we, I think we figured things out. Um, please understand I'm using our desktop for visual and my phone for sound and communication, but can y'all hear me today? Yes, we hear you loud and clear, Donna. Yay! <laughs> so, um, as I've kind of explained, DEFC is is very different in that our DEFC as a whole owns our building. Mm -hmm. um, we have, what, nine or ten now? I don't know. Well, we're building more. Um, but we also are a harm reduction organization. Mm -hmm. This means that we do have people in our housing who are in danger of ODing. We, we have mm -hmm. Narcan and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. So our policy is that if we don't hear from somebody in 72 hours, we check. But also we have people who are a danger to themselves or whatever, they go on the ECL list. And this means somebody needs to see them every shift. We tend to call them first. Mm -hmm. you know, they, we have the intercoms and we tend to call them first. If we don't hear from them, we have to go check. Uh, However, for mm -hmm. us, it is in the lease. It is in the lease or mm -hmm. the paperwork that has all the policies that this is something that we do. So there's kind of like a heads up. Of course, we have people who are pretty mentally ill who might not remember this there. So, but we always do go with another person. Here's the other question that I have for you. And I know this might be splitting hairs. We have the PM who is the program manager. The people who do it, and then we have um, what we call case managers, the CSSs, and we have residential counselors who run the desk. Mm -hmm. Those are the people who usually go do the check-ins. Does that make a difference? Do you think because the counselors and service providers rather than property managers? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, ideally it should be a property manager, but if you if you're set up that way, you can it can it can be another person going up to the unit 
with you. I, I just always recommend mm-hmm. two people so yeah. that you can Pretty vouch deep. for each other. Plus right. you can also, um, you know, I, I, I've, I found some bodies. Um, I found my tenant dead. I've, I've, yeah. had, I've had service staff that came to me and said, you know, I can't find the property manager or the property manager is busy doing something else. I think we have an emergency. I want to go check on this tenant. Um, I What I said to this person was, okay, give me the details of why you think this is an emergency. And he went through yeah. all of the details. And I said, okay, it sounds like this is not normal. Yes, I, I agree. Somebody needs to go check on this tenant. I also asked, do you, do you have that kind of an understanding with the tenant? And he said, yeah. And usually the tenant was pretty good about when they had appointments on being at the appointment. So all of that to say, I was like, okay, sounds like that we need to check on this person. I tried to contact yeah. the property manager. Now, meanwhile, I was in charge of the whole department. So I was over the property managers and the service staff the way we were set up. So I had keys to everything. I had the master keys, never used them, didn't carry them around with me, really wanted to stay out of that. But because the the property manager was busy doing an audit with other, with somebody else, like with outside providers and couldn't get away, I went with the service person. Because the service person kept yeah. saying, I could do this by myself. And I'm like, no, I don't feel comfortable with yeah. it. Because now, remember, I've had all yeah. of these other incidents. So I go with him. We find the person dead on the floor. My staff person had never found the dead body. He freaked out. And, and I had to calm him down. And tell him to leave the unit, go down, go call the police. Because at that time, we, we didn't all have cell phones. Go call the police, report it. I'm, we're both going to leave out of this unit and wait until the police get here. So we both left mm-hmm. out of the unit. We waited for the police. The police had to come in, do their due diligence. They determined it was a natural cause. And fine. Now, I've had other people who there were suspicious causes on their death. Again, you don't want your staff going in. If they do go into the unit and they find the person unresponsive, you only want them doing a little bit. You don't want you want them to check the pulse and get out of the unit. Check the pulse. If the person doesn't have a pulse, they're dead. You call the police. You leave the unit. Don't start touching things. Don't start looking around because you're, it could be a um, crime. We're trained, yeah, we're trained to do CPR or to try to do life-saving wow. stuff. Wow, wow. But so, yeah, we, we have to take CPR. We have to use, we all know how to use um, even the, the mechanical things in our office. We're all mandated since we're outreach. When we go to these buildings, we just have them get, we help them get um, houses and we follow them for a few months, but we're mandated to carry um, I, Narcan and we all know yeah. how to use it. Which in that case, yeah, which in that case, you want two people going with you anyways, because you want somebody calling 911 while you're doing life-saving stuff. So that is kind of how we're set up. And as I said, we, it, it's, it's a little bit different with us. It's a lot mm-hmm. different with us in a lot of ways because of how we, you know, make this stuff work. So, yeah, well, I, I say as long as you have clear policies and guidelines for staff yeah. and everybody understands what they can and cannot do and everybody on the staff is clear you're in you're yeah. you're okay and you're in decent yeah. shape legally yeah. as to yeah. the 
as to the fidelity, you might lose some points. But again, you, you have to control what you can control. And, and some of your programming is based on your funding. That's fine. I Not a problem. But just make sure all your staff are clear about the policies and what they can and can't do and that it's documented. Other, other questions about this, because I, I know a lot of times we get really loose with, you know, or we feel like because we're services and we're there to help the person that we are okay to go into the units. Again, remember what Kimberly said, some people want a break from us. I know I would need a break. That's perfectly fine. We shouldn't be because we haven't seen people in a day that doesn't qu qualify as an emergency unless you know that person and you know that person always makes their meetings and you had a meeting with them and they didn't show up, they didn't call, then yeah, I could see how you can feel like that's an emergency. Always have two people going up and also if you go up, you only need, you're only going to check to see if the person is okay. Here's another one. I'll give you another example of one, what happened when one service person went up to somebody's unit without an agreement and without, and, and thinking they were doing a good thing. They thought something was wrong with this client. So they went up to her unit and opened, knocked on the door. She didn't answer. They opened the door and went in and caught her doing drugs. They were saying to me, well, we should evict her. And I said, why should we evict her? Now, at the time, our building was supposed to be no substance use, no, no illegal drugs yeah. in the building. They wanted to kick Which her out. Which we do out. not do. Yeah. We, we, said, ne no. we never make I, somebody leave for that. Sorry. Yeah. No, I know. But what, I, what I'm just saying is you never know what you're going to encounter when you go into somebody's unit. You can encounter all sorts of things. You just you make sure whatever your policies and procedures are around this, that they're documented that every staff person understands and every staff person has to make sure they're following that, that policy to the T. Because it does become a legal issue. It does also become a choice issue or a, I don't want services right now. I want some privacy and you are trying to force me to work with you, even though, you know, you say it's, it's voluntary. So just, just make sure whatever you have that it's clearly documented and everybody understands and that you don't have people going rogue on you, going up because they, you are not there and they feel like it's an emergency. I know where the key is. I should be able to just go up and do a quick check. Uh, Cherie, is your hand up again? It is. Am I taking okay. too much time? No, no. This is okay. I no, don't worry. Okay, so this so this is like making me think about a lot of stuff I do. So <laughs> um, <laughs> that's good. So one of the things we do is we do program inspections mm -hmm. for uh to make sure they can pass their annual inspection. Mm -hmm. So I recent I recently stopped our our uh, property manager on coming with me to program inspections. I said, that isn't the purpose. You don't get to look in the room. The other uh, purpose is to look in the room when they first get here. We do like monthly inspections till they get a, three in a row passed. Then we do quarterly, then annually to help them learn the process of keeping their units up to King County standards. But the property manager should only be able to do annual. So I always put a 48 hour notice as the pro program manager to say, I'm going to come do the inspection. Mm -hmm. Here's what it, we're looking at. Mm -hmm. But I really, there shouldn't be any 
legal stuff if it isn't there because I'm doing like I'm supporting you to make sure you can keep your unit up to standard and I'm not bringing a white glove it could be you know it's just the King County um standards like if the inspector came is mm -hmm. there a place to jump out your window is there all that stuff yeah what do you I, feel about that because I just really I, I, am I, I even allowed to put a 48 hour notice as a program manager well technically if it, is it your buildings? Is it your um, agency's housing? Yeah, it is. But we contract with our property manager. So it's a different company that does our pro mm -hmm. property management, even though it's our building. Yeah. I mean, I, I, well, I, I think it's good that you give notice so that people know you're coming. I get like two I, weeks I, notice. <laughs> I, I would, but you know, one of the things is I used to do, I used to go around with the property manager to do the inspections of the units to make sure that I understood what the issues were so that I could support the, the participant in correcting the things that were wrong in their unit. That's yeah. But, so I, I, but that. I, but I never did it on my own. I always did it with the property manager. And, and we also had a set time of the year when inspections, when the real inspections would happen that counted. But every month we did, the property manager would go through all the units in the buildings and do inspections, but also do um, spraying for bugs and looking for fire hazards. Yeah, we have that. But then just when they first move in, I do like the first three months I come in and I do, hey, this is what an inspection looks like. This is what you'll need to do to make sure mm -hmm. you keep your unit up to it. And I do that. And then once I see three months, you're doing good. Then I do, you see you go once a quarter. And then mm -hmm. once after they're good that we just come once a year. Yeah, but we'll see. But that, but see what, what, what that should be your staff's part of your staff's job. My, all of my staff, and when I was a, a housing specialist, part of my job was going to visit people in their apartments at least once a month. I didn't yeah. have to go in every week, but, and, and part of why I was going into the apartment was to see if bad, be, if bad habits were starting, if we had somebody starting to hoard stuff or if somebody was not really taking care of their units. And then my job was to get in there with them and help them to rectify yep. things if they needed help with that. If they said, no, I got this, then my job was to support them. Yep. But that was part of my job as the housing specialist was to visit people at least once a month in their apartment. Some of the other meetings didn't have to be in their apartments, but at least once a month, I, I would go into people's apartments because if they lost their, if we, if we lost the funding for that unit, they lose their housing because mm -hmm. I mean, all of the housing was program based section eight mm -hmm. and they had to have annual um, inspections. Go ahead, Kimberly. Thank you. I'm sorry. I just wanted to say, like, I would, you know, clearly state the reason, you know, if your staff is doing that to teach skills in how to look for inspections and things, mm -hmm. that makes sense. But if you're doing those just as a separate inspection, then that would be seen as a dual, like an overlap mm -hmm. in roles. So exactly. you'd want to, for fidelity, you'd want to make sure there was a policy stating we do these initial inspections with our participant to teach them skills and what that would look like what to prepare for kind of thing as opposed to this is just something we do uh, um as an additional inspection because then it would look like overlap in roles from support staff and housing management so exactly from a fidelity perspective i would just make sure that it's written in policy mm -hmm. somewhere of why those get done mm -hmm. um if you're doing it as support staff yeah and as support staff my reason for doing it was I didn't assume that people that were coming into our program knew how to take care of their own place, especially some of them had never had a place of their own ever before. And so it was a way for me to figure out what they needed help with. 
Exactly. Um, and then I then I would work with that person to develop a plan of how we're going to approach this from this point on. Like, you know, one person I had was a hoarder. Oh my goodness. I, the, the space <laughs> to walk through was about this wide. And, you know, and the property manager was saying, this person's hoarding, it's unsafe and something needs to happen or we're going to have to pursue eviction. I would go to meet with that tenant and say, okay, here's what the property manager is saying. Let's, let's go through and see how I can support you and how I can help you. Do you need help going through the stuff in this room or do you feel like you can do that on your own? Let's have a clear plan of how we're going to approach this. And I gave some of that own ownership to the tenant because it's not just my responsibility. It's the tenant's responsibility. And many times the tenants would be like, oh, I need help. And so we would devise a plan where I would go to that unit once a week and we would work on small portions of that apartment each time to get things out, to make choices about what should stay, what should go. Um, but it was always in response to the property manager saying, they're starting to get accumulate too much stuff. So I had a good relationship with the property managers where they would, they would know and they would be like, yeah, this person's starting to veer on too much. You need to get involved. I, I think that's a better way to do it is to have your property managers alert you to any concerns that they have and you follow up with people based on that as opposed to just making it a habit to go do a inspection of the unit. I think I'm going to put it more into my case manager's duty, like mm -hmm. you said, going in once a month, being yeah. in that unit once a month, and then they can address it if need be. Exactly. And then you take the inspection piece off right. the program. And it's just that they're in the unit once a month looking around and saying, hey, this isn't going to pass. Let's mm -hmm. talk about it's, what we need to do to get it to pass. Right. And making sure that the people understand that, you know, part of that service person's job is to help them keep their housing. And in order to help them keep their housing, this is something we have to do because they these units have to pass inspections. And so that way tenants know why you're doing it too. And it's, you know, and, and, and that helps the tenants to be more open to it, as opposed to wondering, why in the hell do you need to come into my unit? Rayanne, I see your hand up. Talk to me. Hey, hey, Ms. Pat. There was a question a little bit earlier, um, but it, I just didn't want it to get lost um, about when you're talking about like caseloads and caseload caps. Um, there was a question about what happens when there's so many people referred, um, but there's maybe only one staff. What's the best way for Fidelity to handle all of those incoming referrals? Um, like, do you make them wait? Do you make a wait list? What's your policy? Like, what, what should they do? We're going we're gonna to get there. Somebody's a little bit ahead of me. In, this, in Dimension 7, we're going to get to caseloads, and I'm going to give you some advice about how to deal with that. Beautiful. Thank you. Okay. So any more questions about Dimension 6? You, and so you understand that your referral partners will be also talked to by in the fidelity review and, and some of what they say could affect your score. You also know, you know, that we don't want people going into people's units or having keys to go into people's units unless absolutely necessary. That's, that is six, seven is going into the flexible voluntary services. If you look at 7.1, tenants are the primary authors of their service plans. Somebody tell me, how would you know that tenants are the primary authors of their service plans? It fits what the tenant's needs are and 
uh, aligns with what their goals are versus maybe like a cookie cutter format that we might have in our brains about what would work. Exactly. And and one way to show that it is the tenant's words is to put it in their words and put quotation marks. That way, you know, this is what the tenant wanted. So it's important to really think about, um, oops, I my, sometimes my computer is very temperamental about changing pages. Um, so we, so I, I think one of the best uh, practices is to just put stuff down in the tenant's own words and make sure that you and the tenant have an understanding of why that's there and what that means. Uh, so you get a four if the tenant, tenants are putting, are the authors of their own plan. 7.1b, tenants initiate and are offered routine opportunities to modify their service selections. So that service plan, it should not be written in stone. If the tenant wants to make changes, you should be making changes. That document changes. should be yep. a living document. It should not be just something you take out once a year to look at. When tenants are meeting goals, you should be saying, okay, we met this goal. Now we should establish a new goal. Somehow you, but we, we want to see the changes to the service plan. So it's fine to have the person changing their service plan. We want to see that. We want to see, we want to see movement. We don't want to see that the tenant is uh, basically has the same goals for an entire year. And they've already accomplished everything on their service plan, but we just haven't done another service plan. We wanna see those changes. We wanna see when they meet those goals that the goals change or they change their mind. Some people come in and want one thing in housing. And once you give them all that information, they change their mind. We need to change the documentation to reflect that. That's a good thing. So that again, is about documentation and making sure that you are doing a good job of documenting that a person may, wants to make changes to their service plan. So that's one part. The next part is the extent to which tenants are able to choose the services they receive. We want tenants to be able to choose the services they want. If, the, if they can choose from an array of services, that's optimal. That gets you a four. So basically, every person is an individual. We don't want you um, having the same goals for every person on your caseload. We don't want you see, we don't want to see you offering every person on your caseload gets to do talk about budgeting and ADL skills, adult learning uh, skills. We don't, we don't, we don't need to see that because everybody's not going to have those same needs. And while everybody might need to learn how to do a budget, we all learn to do budgeting different ways, right? It's not a one size fits all. So we want to see variety when we look at service plans, when we see the services that you're providing your people. We want to see that the services are based on that person, not that you just offer this the same array to everybody. The next part, service mix is highly flexible and can adapt to type, location, intensity, and frequency. So what we want to see is that you, we don't want to see that you visit all of your people on your caseload once a month. If, if everybody is once a month, then you're doing the same for everybody. But what would be nice is if 
we saw that some people are being seen more frequently and some people might not be seen every month. There are some people that got to a point that they were so stable. I didn't need to see them once a month. Even though we did have policies about checking the units, when the property manager did their inspection, they're going to tell me if that unit is in jeopardy of being, you know, not meeting an inspection. I don't need to see everybody every month. The tenant can choose, you know, they, I've had tenants say to me, can we take a month off? I need to really just think about stuff and I need some space. Not a problem. Your, your, your agency has to be able to do that. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. All right. All right, there's more. Because seven keeps going. Seven is the extent to which services are consumer driven. Again, we want to see you offering services that that person wants not just what you think they want or what you think they need. Say you you got a person who you think, oh man, they need, they need to be working on budgeting, but they don't see the need for it. Should you be working on budgeting with them? Probably, but in a way that they are okay with. Some of the people I did budgets with, I did budgets at the grocery store. Because that's that worked for them. They could they understood that it made sense. They didn't feel like you know they were being forced to budget. It was it was a, in a way that they that made sense for them. So we would go to the grocery store. They would be picking out items. I would be talking about teaching them how to look at what the cost is and how to compare comparison shop. Because a lot of people don't know how to comparison shop. That's budgeting. I'm giving them information. I'm teaching them so they can be independent. That was always my goal for all of the people that were on my caseload. Make them independent. Because if they're independent, I can take on other people on my caseload. But if they were totally dependent on me, I'm stuck. I could never have new clients on my caseload. Now, we get to the, the thing that everybody was wanting to know. Caseload. Caseload is 15 people for each staff, full-time staff member. 15. Mm-hmm. For 15 people on your caseload, you get a four. If you have 16 to 25 people, that's a three. You have 26 to 35, that's a two. More than 36, that's a one. Now, I know the question. How can we do this? with the caseload mm -hmm. of 15, when some of the people on my caseload have been on my caseload for a while. What I recommend is having two caseloads, having a caseload for active people on your caseload and a caseload for inactive people. Because some people on your caseload are going to be, you're going to be actively working with them. Some people you might not be actively working with. Break up your caseloads. Have a case, an active caseload and an inactive caseload. I also got to the point that I had a caseload of people that I was just, I had on maintenance. And maintenance meant everything was going well with them that they really did not need much from service staff, but every now and then they might have a need that comes up. And I was there if something came up. But those, those were people that I didn't worry about. I knew and trusted that if they needed me, they would contact me. 
my, that, my, my, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, if you have less than 15, um, is that, is that, does that drop your score? No, it does not drop your score. What it means is that you, you need to be giving that fit, that, that less than lucky. 15, as much <laughs> services as you can and be trying to get them to independence. Okay. Yeah. Cause so with, with our, our, with my company, our max for our caseload is 15. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's our max. And so we don't have any more than 15, but we have a, a, a phase system, oh. right? Where um, some of the people, uh, individuals, like say, for instance, they can go from phase three to phase two, uh-huh. right? Or, or because they may uh-huh. have, you know, uh, relapsed or something like that. And so we have to put them in a more like extensive, like we see them more than once a week or something mm-hmm. like that. And so, um, but we don't have any more than you know, a caseload of 15, but sometimes some people, let's say graduate. And so we, in, in the interim, you know, it may take a week or two weeks for us to get another uh, person on our mm-hmm. caseload or something mm-hmm. like that. And so that, that still keeps us oh. out of four. That's, that's awesome. I mean, I, 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 when you look at the amount of work that you have to do and the fact that we're choosing the hardest to serve people, Hopefully that that gives you an idea of why we want that caseload to say to stay low is because if it if that caseload gets too high, can you do your job reasonably and do it reasonably well? Carrie, I see your hand up. I, I go ahead. Talk to me. Yes, ma'am. A um, couple questions that are kind of colliding for me is. Um, can you shed clarity? Are we able then to um, capture the fidelity points by transitioning to caseloads? Uh, so, for instance, I could work with 30 people and have an inactive caseload of 15 or so, and then an active caseload of 15 or so. Yes, you can do that. But here, but here's what I would recommend in not just doing that, but having a policy around how that should work. Because at some point, that inactive load needs to be cleared out. Yes. If, if people are inactive for too long, why are they keeping taking up space on your, on your caseload? Um, the other thing is some people from that inactive caseload should hopefully move to, an act, to your active caseload. And so you want to have some policy around, you know, how are you going to manage those caseloads and how do you keep them, you know, um, what's the word? Um, keep them, keep them engaged and also not let people use that as a way to basically have a bigger caseload. So yes. you want those cases to truly be inactive. And, my, and once they move to active, then they need to go on to your regular caseload. And then you can bring in another person to the inactive caseload. But you want to really dictate how everybody's managing that. And, it, and I'll tell you this, it's easier to have the whole team managing it the same way as opposed to, okay, well, it's a team of Pat and, and Rayanne and Carrie Pat's doing it this way, Carrie's doing it that way, and Rayanne's doing it that way. It should be, we are all doing it the same. This is our policy around it, and right. we all know this policy. And my second question to bite off of, of this uh, tenant that you have set is, how can I serve all of the referrals that are coming in from multiple partners when I don't want to leave them unserved. I don't ever want to say right. no to a colleague or this isn't a good referral, even though they may not match the qualifications. Of well, it, well, What's but the it, best but, way to be. Well, if they don't met, if they don't meet the qualifications, you need to say they don't meet the qualifications because you don't want people referring somebody who, you know, don't meet the qualifications of the program. Because then they they should be allowed to go someplace else and figure out a different plan. So you don't want to ever let somebody leave somebody hanging out there if you know their person doesn't meet the the criteria. The other thing that I would recommend is if your caseload 
is at its max and you're still getting all of these referrals, your agency has to make a decision around do they want to bring in additional staff people to do housing or maybe they don't, they are fine just having one person and they don't feel like they need to, you know, do anything more than that. But if you are getting that many referrals, there's obviously a need and your agency can do something to, to you know, deal with that. Bring on another staff person and have two of you doing it. Makes sense? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We do have a few things in the works and uh, everything is coming together very quickly, I have a great management team that's really on board. They're seeing happy clients and a lot of housing placements, by the way. Uh, we're all experiencing the success together mm -hmm. um, from everybody on a client's multidisciplinary team, mm -hmm. including myself. So they've Excellent. been really on board. Um, so thank you for, you know, kind of clarifying the, the, how we can manage a, a large caseload while we anticipate growing the program with, with other staff. And, and the thing you need to be careful of, now I give you these, these suggestions about having caseloads, but it doesn't mean that those caseloads stay stagnant. You need to have policies written around when does a person go from inactive to active when is it a person goes off of inactive to not able to work with this person, not responding, need to drop? You need to have something that's clear for staff to know when is that the case. Um, and it should be everybody doing it the same. You really get into trouble when everybody starts to do it their own way. So I those. Yeah, so those policies really help. And it also helps, it helps your team to understand what they can and cannot do. It also is good for when your team has to talk to outsiders, they can say, well, our policy states this. Could we satisfy that with the letters? We send a client letters. If we can't reach them, we schedule them an appointment to come see me. I schedule them an appointment and I send them a letter to that effect. And if the client um, doesn't engage, I call two or three more times before I alert my manager, my supervisor, that this person is inactive. And they advise me whether to try again or to place them on inactive on my housing log. So long as that's documented, um, Fidelity is able to see that in my, in my notes, correct? But and that satisfies? Well, that that's part of it, but we would also need to hear about the, you. To, what you just told me is your policy. You just you just laid out your policy. Put that in writing, and and you're good. That plus those letters, you're golden. But you just went. You just told me what your policy was. Kimberly, is your hand up again? Yeah, I just saw a question about counting people as maintenance and Shri, I would say I would question what you guys consider to be maintenance because mm -hmm. services should be very individualized and what maintenance is for one person may be very different from another. So mm -hmm. I know sometimes policies are that once they're housed, we just put them in maintenance and we only visit them once a month. But I would caution folks to remember that each person may need, you know, when someone's housed, sometimes that's when the real work happens. So defining what maintenance means and then yes. you know that engagement really could you know when I say active I'm thinking of people that are engaging at least once a month mostly bi-weekly or weekly and if somebody's not engaging and there's a policy that says we haven't seen them you know we've we've checked in once a week and don't get any response you know we've sent a letter you know having a policy that really states what is the process for somebody going into inactive and then what does that look mm -hmm. like for them to get re-engaged or close, mm -hmm. um, but maintenance, I'd be I would be curious. To see you, you, yes, and you're absolutely right, Kimberly. If you are putting people in maintenance, the way people went on maintenance for me was because they had been housed for a, a long period of time. 
in that long period of time, we have been continually reducing the, the, you know, the, the frequency of our visits. It kept reducing and reducing to the point that they were like, I don't want to, I don't need you for the next month. And then the next month we would check in and they'd be like, look, everything's fine. Nothing's changed. I don't really need to keep doing this. Yeah, um, so that's kind of what I'm saying. Like I have residents because we're supportive housing, right? So mm -hmm. we're here. And so like I have, but I have residents that have been living here for years. They're on social security. Their income's great. Their budget's great. They go fishing every morning. They set up with their hobbies, reconnected with their family, they stop as they walk by, they say, hi, show me a picture of their grandkids and walk on. So I'm not really doing work with them right now. Right. They're still in our facility. Mm -hmm. And if they ever need, like, you know, one, the one person I'm thinking of directly, he started having medical issues. And so all of a sudden he needed more support in, you know, managing all the people that needed to help him with his medical issues. Mm -hmm. He's now through with those medical issues and back to his normal routine of going fishing, going to the senior center, you know, doing his life. Mm -hmm. And he don't need me in his business, you know, yeah, but, 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 but I, but I would go with what Kimberly said, because you need to define that. And, and I had a, I had a policy that went with maintenance because I had some people who were in maintenance that all of a sudden had a crisis and were back to being active. And so I, they, people mm -hmm. would be moving from caseload to caseload. Like I had, I've had people move from maintenance back onto my active caseload, but I had policy around when do they move back into being active? Okay. And, and so when people are looking at your program, they, nobody's going to know what's in your head. And if you start explaining that, they'll be like, oh yeah, that sounds great. Do you have that documented? Okay. Awesome. So document it. Document what? active inactive and maintenance would be yeah and, and what are and the rules that you can move between them fluidly right you know because different people have different issues you know needs at different times mm -hmm. and, and how and and when do you when do you go from being maintenance to active again or when okay. do you go from inactive to being you know taken off of all the caseloads because nobody's seen you what's the process for that so this way, when people come into your program, the, the clients understand as well as you do that, okay, um, you said you're, I'm on the inactive caseload and I have this much time to become active. Or, you know, we, we want people to, the client should also be clear about how, how do I get on this caseload? Or if I want to become active, how do I get, become active? So okay. it's good to just have it in writing so everybody's clear about it. Uh, Heidi, I see mm -hmm. your hand up. Talk to me. Heidi? I see you came off mute, but I cannot hear you. Uh, you have no sound? Oh, are you, does your computer have a speaker or is there, when you go, you see the mute button at, on your screen, it's by the video button. If you put that little arrow on the mute, on that mute arrow, it should go down and it says select the microphone. Make sure it's selecting the right microphone. If there's only one option, then that's the only microphone you have. And, and that, you know, that's different. You see what I'm saying? Did you find the mute button? You're typing? Okay. No worries. Type. I'll, I'll try to read it when I see it. All right. Any other questions? Carrie, did you have your hand up again or is that the old hand up? I think that's my old hand up. <laughs> my apologies. Oh, no worries. I know sometimes they don't go down immediately. So, so are people clear about the caseload size? Mm -hmm. I know it's, it's a, um, the, the information I'm giving you about the caseloads 
is information that you need to know, but don't don't just think that because you say, oh, we have an active caseload and an inactive caseload that people are going to understand that. People are going to ask questions. Well, how do you get off the active to the inactive? So your policy should be stating all of this. How do you go off of one list to another list? How often are those lists reviewed? Because we don't want to see, um, you know, no rules of, around the list. And that that leads you to believe that, okay, it's really too fluid. Like, we don't know what's going on and there's no policy to help us understand it. All right. I'm waiting to see if, if other things come up. But in essence, if you want to, if you want to do it this way, make sure your policy is stipulating what you wanted to say. All right. Uh, so Heidi says we put people on a soft hold for maintenance and check with them one a week and then less as they say. So are they still counted on the 15 caseload? I don't know what the soft hold for maintenance means. Do you have a policy that states what a soft hold means? If you don't have a policy, what you may need is a policy around what does that mean for a soft hold and what's the policy for getting for having for moving to a different caseload? I see you typing away. I'll let you, I'll, I won't rush you. I, I'll come back and look for your question. Oh, you, well, you got it up that quick. You're good. Um, a soft hold is they don't want to be active. Okay, so what's your policy around when do they become active? Or can they just sit there and take up space for however long they want to? And so that, if you need, so I, I let me just recommend this policy or this should be documented because if I'm asking these questions, your, your policy should address the kind of questions I'm asking. There, it shouldn't be an unlimited time to be on a caseload and be a soft, you know, a soft hold because then you could have, say you have what, 20, you have 15 soft holds on your caseload. Does that mean you have enough work to do? Probably not. So you, you might want to think the policy is to keep them on the list for the, for the auth authorized dates and they are saying I'm good. Oh, so you're waiting, are you waiting to hear back from somebody to say that they, that you can work with them? Uh, 180 days equals six months for service authorization period. Sometimes, like you say, Pat, the client can go active, inactive, active. The client could also request a reauthorization and be given another six months. Okay, so, but again, you don't want to have 15 soft holds on your caseload. And if you're waiting for the, the authorization to come through, you, you might, I would recommend looking at that. You, we check on them and if they say I'm okay, then we continue to check on them and when they done. When they say we need help, we help write the policy or somebody needs to write that policy up because then anybody coming into your organization can read the policy and see how you deal with your caseloads. Does that make sense? I, you might already have a policy. If you don't have a policy, maybe you can talk to Kimberly or Rayanne and they can answer your questions better 
it's hard. I know we're, you're typing as fast as you can go and I'm trying to read, but it probably isn't the best to answer your questions. Connect with either Kimberly or Rayanne and they can help you think this through and maybe even think through what the policy should be. But I always recommend having a policy just because it sounds like you know what you're doing or you can, you know, say, okay, if this, then that, then this, then that. But can all your staff say that? Because that's where a lot of places get in the trouble. I, we talked to one person, they said, this is the policy. And we talked to another staff person, they say, no, that's not how I do it. This is how I do it. If that's the case, you need a policy. And we see that a lot, right, Kimberly and Ray? And how many times do you see or hear one staff person does it this way and another staff person does it a different way? Yeah, it happens all the time. And that's why we really encourage agencies to do policies for their supportive housing programs or their FCS programs that are specific and not so agency generals. That way, if you have new staff coming in, they have something that guides their work and it's not you know, from one person to another passing information along because that's when things get watered down and people start doing it inconsistently. Yes. All right. So um, now here's, here's another one that behavioral health services are team-based meaning all behavioral health services are provided through a team, including psychiatric services. A good example is an ACT team or a assertive, assertive community treatment team. We are. Yeah. So we are. basically- It's gonna be a PAC program. Okay, somebody, somebody is out, you're, you're not on mute and we can hear the conversation. So again, we want to make sure you're working as a team with all the other people that are working with that person. So you're the housing specialist. If a person is working on, is, if they have an ACT team, you should be meeting with that ACT team on a regular basis, not only when there's an issue. First of all, you got to establish, you got to make sure everybody understands the roles and responsibilities of each person on that team. And you don't want to wait till something happens before you're dealing with that team. Teamwork is important, but everybody talking to each other is just as important. And it's not only that we want to see, um, we want to hear that you're working as a team. We also, a lot of times we'll want to sit in on a meeting to see how you're working as a team. Can anybody tell me why would it be important for housing specialists to go to meet with the clinicians? Why would you want to do that? I, I believe that, you know, it's important to um, meet with the cl clinicians because the information that you get from the clinicians will kind of help you uh, know like what they're like what causes their anxiety um, you know if they have anxiety or things like that like you'll know kind of how to maneuver uh, around your client versus just going in and you know being gung-ho but you don't really know the background uh, of the clients absolutely also there are other reasons why any other reasons any other reasons why you think it's important to meet with the uh, to to collaborate with them remain on the same page and stay updated absolutely here's the thing i've had clinicians as put work with my work with the person who i'm working with in housing and things changed Th situations changed. I nobody kept me in the loop. So I when in those team meetings, it was about me saying, okay, what's going on with this person? I had noticed this person is doing different things or is changed. What's going on? Then I find out there was a medication change. And 
then the person is talking to me about their medication saying, I don't like this new medication. It's making me really groggy. And it's really hard for me to, to manage everything on this medication. I need to be communicating with the clinician about, okay, yes, you did this, or this is going on, and this is what I'm hearing. So that we're, I'm not going to be saying to the tenant, oh, well, next time you talk with your clinician, you should mention that. If I know I'm meeting with the clinician on a regular basis, I could bring it up and say, yeah, I noticed that she was really lethargic and, you know, even she just did not seem to be herself. We can be actively working on that before it becomes an urgent situation. You know what I mean? Or before she gets to the point that she really doesn't know, you know, the tenant becomes in jeopardy, we can be proactively dealing with this. So I think it's important to have those meetings. And again, everybody's looking at this person from a different perspective. And this goes back to we're treating, we want to be a part of that team that's treating the whole person because everything is going to affect their housing. They get a new boyfriend, new girlfriend, new partner, that's going to affect their housing. They get a job, that's going to affect their housing. They have, they have some trauma that came up or they something didn't go well in another part of their life. Everything is going to affect their housing. And, and their mental health can affect their housing. I need to be talking to those people so we are making sure we are treating that whole person. Donna, I see your hand up. Talk to me. Yeah, so we had a person who was a pretty severe alcoholic. We have a person who's a pretty severe alcoholic who has not lived inside for 30 years. And we got with a um, scattered site apartment manager who agreed to let this person live there. And so we have me who's basically paying the rent mm -hmm. or our organization basically paying the rent through our HARP program. We provided him with a harm reduction um, a CD counselor and uh, another case manager. And we talk with the property manager fairly often. And it is what made him successful. It's what's making him successful in learning how to help this person because the property manager knows that we're helping this person. We, we, we're on it. We're, we're going to deal with you know issues that come up and it's made a big difference and hopefully that particular property manager will also be willing mm -hmm. to work with someone else mm -hmm. who would need housing like that and so you know he's he's struggling but he still lives there after after and, and that's what and that's what now. that's what yeah. it's about that's what it's about and that's and that also means that you know, we have to do whatever it takes to help a person maintain their housing. And a lot of times, yep. I think with us not talking to each other, sometimes we create the problem for the tenant because we're not talking yep. to each other. Yeah. So. Um, all right. Um, Kimberly, what time do we, what time do we go till? I, I just want to be aware of time I don't want to go past our end time we go till noon okay so we got a little time yep all right perfect this last one on here might be a surprise for some of you to ex um oh oh wait no so hold on let me I my my screen already flipped to another page so the last one, the extent to which services are provided 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Are you all providing services 24 seven? Mm 
because it's important that we have, I see some of you saying yes, but I don't think everybody uh, provides 24 seven services. So here, here's what you get a four for. If services are available 24 seven, notice they said available. What that means is I spend, I, I don't have to be at the office 24 seven, but I, I need to have a way that if there's an urgent issue at the building with one of my people, I need to be made aware of it so that I can get in there to help deal with it. Uh, so I have a question about that. So, yes. um, and someone put it actually in the chat. So um, our housing, the well, my program is ran eight to five, but I always provide them with a crisis number um, that allows them to connect with me because we're able to um, find out if there was a crisis. And then, you know, in the morning when I come in, I get either a text message or an email from uh, my supervisor uh, to let me know what happened uh, with my participants. Is that the same thing? Well, so let me ask you this question. So okay. they, you say they, you give them a crisis line. So yeah. is that crisis line going to your supervisor or somebody else? So the, the crisis line goes to our crisis department Okay, but, but my supervisor is in the same office. So when it's one of our participants that are in our program, then mm -hmm. my supervisor is notified, which notifies me. Okay, so but but there's somebody there all at all times of the day to help that person if they have an urgent issue. That's correct. So that's that suffices. What I would recommend is if you don't have a policy that states that that's that's how you're doing it. Okay. You, that Three you eight might want to have a policy that says this is how we're going to make sure we provide 24 7 services. Okay. We give people the access to this crisis line. My supervisor finds out who heck they, they can talk to somebody 24 7. When I come in in the morning, I'm aware of who called into the crisis line and I follow up with them. That okay. should be good enough for, for the purposes of ensuring that people are getting 24 seven services. Okay, all right, thank you. Some people give people a crisis line to an external group other than their agency and says, well, we give them this crisis number to call. That's fine if it's a psychological issue. What if the crisis is my toilet is overflowing and I can't get it to stop and water is all over my apartment. A crisis line is not going to deal with that. What, how do you deal with that? Somebody has the toilet running. It's causing a lot of property damage. It's just, it's going through down to the neighbor below. It is a maintenance issue. But do you make sure that the tenants know who to call if it's a maintenance issue and that they are clear about who to contact after hours if there's a maintenance issue? Or do they call you? If, they're, if they know that that's a maintenance issue and they know to call maintenance, great. But so, you need to make sure that that's part of that, that that's not just something you think, but you need to make sure that that's true for all the tenants. I found, I found even with staff, sometimes <laughs> they call me the program manager instead uh -huh. of the property manager, uh -huh. because I'm just the go-to. Exactly. And I go, well, thank you for calling and letting me know. Do you have the property manager's phone number? I'm glad you shut it off by the valve underneath the toilet. But see, if if you if know, your staff are, I'm the go-to, and that's okay. Right. It, it, they have a go-to. Well, it it's fine. But what I would recommend is putting in a policy to say, because what happens if you're not there? Who's the go-to? 
that'd be my director. And there is a policy to call the property manager. Okay. They just forget and call me right. because which, they're, which, they see me more often and know yeah. that I'm, and then I tell them to call that person. Right. Don't just fix it. So that way I'm teaching them, yes. hey, you know, before calling me, you can call them. Yes. But in a well, state of emergency, a lot of times residents get confused yeah, and they no. just reach out to that one person they know. Absolutely. No. And that happens a lot with the tenants too. Sometimes the tenants are afraid to call the property manager because they don't want to create a problem. So they will more than likely call services and say, what should I do with this? And we just need to make sure that we, the, the point here is make sure that the clients understand who to call in the middle of the night when they have an emergency. Making sure that what one of the things I used to do is make a, a thing for people's refrigerator to put in and I would laminate a piece of paper with a crisis number. And in our case, our crisis number was we had, we had a cell phone that everybody had a chance to carry for a week. And so, but it was one phone number. So that was our crisis number. If you called that number anytime, day or night, you were going to get a person. I also would put their landlord's phone number on there. I would also put, if the landlord had a maintenance person, I would put that phone number on. I would laminate it and put it on their refrigerator with a sticker. So anytime they needed somebody, they knew where to look for those numbers. And if the numbers changed, I would change out the, the flyer. It's important that we not only make sure our staff understand, but we need to make sure that um, giving the tenants the information so they don't, they don't have to guess who to call. And I would even, I, one of the things I go through with tenants is when to call the landlord, when to call me. Call the landlord if something is wrong in your unit. If any appliance in your unit is not working properly, you call the landlord or you call their maintenance person. But making sure that, because you don't want to leave them out there not knowing who to call, or you don't want to be the, the only person getting all the phone calls, because we don't want you to be burnt out either. So making sure people know who to call and easy way is giving, is putting it in, you know, you could even buy those plastic sheets of paper where you put stuff in, you could put a piece of paper in. It keeps that piece of paper clean and dry without, you know, stuff on it. And a magnet, we, we actually had magnets with, our, with the name of the agency on it and our phone number. It, it was just a way to, to make them independent, to make them have some responsibility of, okay, I know this is a maintenance issue. Here's the maintenance number. I should call maintenance. If you are only providing services during office hours from eight to five or nine to five, or and you might do some services on the weekend, then you're going to get a two. If you're only providing services Monday through Friday, eight to five, you get a one. So it's important what what this is getting at is to make sure that the tenants know what their what they can and can't do who they can call giving them some freedom and some independence on we're going to give you all the numbers i'm telling you when it's when these are the issues here's who you call when it's a mental health issue you call this number when it's a when it's something wrong in your apartment, you call this person. That gives tenants independence from you, which is what we want to do. We don't want tenants calling us for everything. Because 
what purpose does that meet? That means I am going to be burnt out because I got people calling me for everything instead of teaching my clients or my, my tenants or my participants, giving them some skills and saying, here's who you call. We, we, we cannot be everything for everybody. And what, what our job should be in permanent supportive housing is helping people retain their housing and become independent of us. The only way we can do that is by giving them information and training them and helping them to problem solve so that they can get to that point. Because, you know, having somebody on your caseload forever is not an option because funding at some point will run out. We, our job is to make those clients or make the clients independent. This is gonna help them in the real world. They're, when they go, if they wanna ever move out of our housing and move into some housing that doesn't have services, we need to set them up for that. We need to help them to get to that point. Questions? Because we just went through all of the dimensions and how they are scored. You will get this sheet. All of these sheets that we just went over will be included in your handouts. Questions? No questions? Let's take a 10 minute break. I have the top of the hour. We'll meet back in 10 minutes. Go take care of your needs.
for those who have just come into the room, we're on break. So break will be going for another three minutes. All right, are we all back? All right, I'm here. <laughs> Let's go. So we, we get to a point now where if you are going to be a Fidelity reviewer, you, you've gathered a ton of information. And, and so we've been talking about all of these today and yesterday, policies and procedures. I think everybody on this call understands why the policies and procedures are important. We also do interviews with participants, staff, and leadership. So when a fidelity review is happening, happening we will talk to some of the participants and get their take on how things are going. We will talk to the majority, if not all of the staff, depending on how big your department is. We try to talk to staff at every level, the peer specialist, the housing specialist, the manager, the leadership of your organization. We, we're, we're asking questions of everybody. Go ahead, Carrie, I see your hand up. I don't know how that's happening, ma'am, but <laughs> oh, oh, okay. I don't have my hand up. I okay, apologize. oh, okay. Oh, no, it's, 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 I think it never went down. <laughs> I have and, all the questions. And so a little thing just popped up saying, Carrie raised her head. I'm like, oh, <laughs> all right. We also look through files. We read through files. 
one of the important things is set up your files to all look the same. There have been times I've looked through files and it's hard to find stuff because all of the files, I've actually went to one agency, they handed me big manila folders with all of the paperwork in a manila folder, which means I had to look at every piece of paper that was in there. There was no easy way to go through and find the information I needed. So the sitting there going through their files took forever. Make, try to make all of your files the same order. Somebody needs to be paying attention to documentation. I'm gonna tell you, it's rare for me to do a fidelity review without mentioning documentation. People do not document well and do not document enough. Oh, what are the questions you're asking the participants? I'll, I'll bring that up in a little bit. Um, Cause we do have, we do have questions that we ask of everybody. Um, another thing we wanna see is we wanna see copies of the HQ inspections. We wanna see lease agreements. You should be documenting the type of housing in the file. And then if they change their mind, you should be documenting the change. What we see a lot is people come into the permanent supportive housing program. They say, I want a regular apartment. Then we see that person move into an Oxford house. What do you think happened? Relapse, it could be relapse. Incarceration, it could be. It could be a lot of things. We don't know what it is because guess what? The person who was doing the documentation did not document. Person has changed their mind and now wants to go into an Oxford house. What we see is that the person asked for a regular apartment and ended up in an Oxford house without any type of information being given that the person changed their mind and decided that they'd rather go into an Oxford house. It could be just that simple. It doesn't have to be complex. It doesn't even have to be incarceration or relapse. It could be that the person decided that a, right now an Oxford house is better for me. But if you don't document it, what it, what it, the message that we get is that this person came to your program and said, I want an apartment. And you made a decision that they weren't ready for an apartment. They needed to go into an Oxford housing. If you don't put the documentation in the file that the person changed their mind, the only assumption we can us go to is you, for whatever reason, made that change. Or maybe you could only find an Oxford house, and that's why they ended up going to one. See what I'm saying? Document. When the person changes their goals, it should be documented. When people change anything, it should be documented. They could have met someone at an Oxford house and wanted to live there. But again, if you don't document, person changed mind now wants to go into a Oxford house. It just looks like you made a change because there's no documentation. We could come, I could probably come up with 20 more reasons why they wanted to go to an Oxford house. None of that matters. What we need to see is that you're honoring that person's choice and you're honoring it by saying, okay, you changed your mind. We're going we're gonna to put down in your goals, 
changed mind, now wants to go into an Oxford house. That's all you have to do. It's not complex. And I know, I, I trust me, I know documentation is not fun. I always have hated documentation. But I've also understood the reason behind documentation. If you don't document it and somebody walks in, somebody else say, you, say you're sick or you leave your job and somebody else comes in and they read the file and not all the information is in there and they have to go to the participant to get all of this information again. Can you see how the participant would be frustrated? Can you see how when... Somebody comes in to look at your files and see incomplete files, how they can't get a feel for what you're doing in your job. It's important that we document. I can't in, say that any stronger than what I'm saying, document. Okay, so let's do this. I'm gonna show you an interview form and I'll, I said somebody asked, I will try to find one that's for um, for the, the participants. And I'm trying to find my form. All right, hold on. Can you see this, this form? That says peer support, per permanent supportive housing interview guide, peer specialist. Oh, I did. I pulled up the wrong one. Oops. Let me pull up the participants. All right. So here are the kind of questions we ask a participant. Sometimes we interview participants together. Sometimes we interview them separately. It really depends on how many participants we're trying to interview and how much time we have. But we asked them to please tell us about your living situation. Where do you live now? Where would you like to live? That sometimes we get to meet participants who are not housed yet. So we asked that question. You know, I, people are not seeing the form. Are you not seeing it? No, Pat, I can see your like uh, file. Um, oh, that, oh, like, okay. Ah, okay. Okay, hold on. Let me, let me do this again. Sorry about that. Hold on. Share screen. No, I need to find the document I had open. See what happens when you have too many things open on your screen? Okay, can you see it now? Yes. Perfect, thank you for coming off mute to tell me that. Um, so please tell us about your housing situation. Where do you live now? Where would you like to live? So of course, if they're living in a place that, that you help them find, we're going to ask, you know, where do you live now? And we ask, where, where, where would you like to live? Because what we're trying to find out is, is this their choice? Did they choose this place? Or would they, did they want to live someplace else, but ended up in this place? Can you see how this is getting to choice? And then the second question, where were you living before this program? What, what, why do you think we ask this question? Anybody? Why do you think this, we ask this question? Anybody? Because nope. we want to know what their experience, they want to know what their experience has been. Um, have they been living on the street? Have they been housed before recently? Um, yeah. Yeah. We're trying to, we're, 
we're trying to make sure that you are having the right people go through your program. Remember, this program should be for the hardest to serve people. If somebody tells me that they were living in an apartment, it was, you know, but they needed, they needed to move and they got into this program. I'm going to be like, huh, if they were already housed, they weren't homeless. So why are they in this yeah. program? They lived in Montana and they don't know their way around Seattle. That and that's the reason to know where they were. Yeah, well, exactly. But but we asked this to make sure that you're serving yes. the hardest to serve people. Yes. Um, who are you working with on your housing? Anybody have any ideas why we would ask this question? You want to know if they're being served. I want to know if they're being served. And I also need to know, like, are, are they working with all of those people? Because some people might be working with all of those people. At some point, I'm going to be asking all of those people, are they meeting to talk about this client? Because if they're meeting with the housing specialist, a peer specialist, and a case manager, and somebody else, we would like for those people to be talking to each other, right? Yeah, Pat, I end up collaborating with a lot of the people that they're already working with or that they plan to work with. It's really helpful. Yes, it, it is very helpful. And, you know, and and we hope that those are regular meetings and and hopefully you're taking some minutes at those meetings and who all was there so you can have all of that. So when we ask if you're collaborating and working with the partners, you bring out those minutes of those meetings and say, here are the minutes. Yes, we're doing it. That's your proof. We also ask, what barriers have you encountered? And sometimes people will say, what do you mean by a barrier? Like, what is, what's getting in your way? What bothers you? What's something that, you know, is a pain in the butt or... And a lot of people will say, well, I have a mental health issue. I have a substance abuse issue, blah, blah, blah. And that's fine. We're just, again, making sure that the right people are getting the services. And, and we might, a follow-up question might be uh, when they say they, that they have, say somebody says uh, a substance use problem is one of the barriers. I might ask, uh, are you seeing somebody about that? And they, if they say yes, I would, my next question would be, are, is your housing specialist working with that person or talking to that person? They may say, yeah, I think they talk or I don't know. It's fine. I just, we want to, we want to make sure you're working with the hardest to serve people. What would make this program better? I've had people say to me, well, if the staff were available, <laughs> that would make this program better. So that mm -hmm. means that yeah, they're not that's seeing that's staff. Uh, we've, I've had lots of different answers. I've had somebody say, um, I'm lonely. I, I, I would like for the housing specialist to come around more. I've heard that many times. A lot of times we put people in housing and we're the only people that go to visit them, which is not a big deal. But remember what I said about the goals of permanent supportive housing, to help people maintain or retain their housing and to become independent. Part of becoming independent means knowing, having some structure to your day. A lot of times what I would do with people who are just moving into a place is walk the neighborhood with them, show them where everything is at, find opportunities for them to get more involved with other things. Because, you know, one of the things is when you move into your apartment, 
say you've been homeless. You even being homeless, a lot of people have structure, right? They go, they get up in the morning, they go to this shelter for breakfast. Then they go over to this place because they have a drop-in center. You can just hang out. Then you go to this place for lunch. Then you go to another drop-in place. Then you, we, when we help people get housing, one of the things we don't think about is we leave them without any structure. Next. What, and, yeah, what and so next? if people don't have structure, sometimes they find trouble to get into. Or sometimes they relapse because they're bored. Sometimes their mental health gets triggered because they're sitting there feeling sorry for themselves. We need to help people access the community because that community provides a lot of things for people. Where's the library? They could go to the library and read a book, go to the library and get on a computer. Where, where is the nearest drop-in center if they want to go to a drop-in center? I've also gotten some people to uh, become volunteers. They wanted to do something, but they didn't want to work. How about being a volunteer? I've, I can't tell you how many people I had volunteering to go to nursing homes to sit with other people and just talk and play cards. It gives people some structure to their day. What we do is we take them out of what we think is an unstructured environment and put them into this apartment without helping them to figure out what are they going to do every day besides just sit there in that apartment. Um, is there anything else we should know about how things are going? We just want to give them the chance if they think of something else or they want us to know something, they can do that. There are some notes down here. Um, you know, we also can be asking people how much do they pay towards their rent? Do you have a lease? Um, the questions we give are not all of the questions. They're a guide. But if you know those dimensions, right? You know the seven dimensions? You can ask other questions. Do you have your own keys to your apartment? Does staff ever, do the service staff ever come into your unit without you knowing it or without contacting you first? All of those questions are fair questions to ask. So, and that's just one of the interviews. That's the interview for the participants. Questions. One of the things that we're also doing by interviewing all of the different people is we're trying to figure out if um, if the if the staff if the client feels like they have everything they need and and feel like they're in a good space so you know that's just one of the things we're trying to figure out but we're also comparing information Say, for instance, the staff person is telling us everybody gets choice, and here's our policy on choice, and here's how we do it. And then we're talking to this participant, and the participant says, I didn't have any choice. They showed me this one place and told me if I didn't decide to move into this place, that they didn't have anything else available. Did that participant experience choice? So then that makes us suspect about your policy. Do you have this policy down to just say we have a policy? But when we talk to the tenants or the clients, they're saying, I didn't get that same choice. So we're also doing checks and balances. We, we're trying to see where, where there's room for improvement. And sometimes we know people fall through the cracks. 
and might not get all the services. What we're trying to determine is this, this, uh, is this a, so this person fell through the cracks or is this an ongoing issue where a lot of people didn't get choice, even though they have a policy that says they give choice. So I just, of course, we, we went through this spread, this score sheet already. You got a chance to see it. I had just included some of it in here for you to see because, you know, Another thing you should know about doing a fidelity review, the way they're done in Washington state is they're done with a team. So you have a team of people. Like some of you could become fidelity reviewers one day and you would be a part of a team that would go into an organization to do a fidelity review. When you have a team doing a fidelity review, you are having that team do it because sometimes you, you do a part of it. You don't get the complete picture. Can anybody tell me how many faces they see in this, in this photo, in this diagram? How many faces are you seeing? So I see two, I see nine. <laughs> I see eight, nine, 10, eight, six. So all of you are seeing, I see a 12, a nine, a eight. All of you who are seeing something different, an 11, some of you are seeing more than others, and some of you are not seeing as much. One of the things, the reasons we do have a multiple people doing the interviews and doing all of the fidelity, we're hoping that between all of you, that you're going to get the, the complete picture. And that's going to make that fidelity review much better because everybody's a part of it. Thomas, do you have your hand up? Yeah, I was um, <clears throat> talking. Um, so when it comes to choice, um, one of the things, and, and you can tell me if I'm right or, or wrong in this. Um, so whenever I ask somebody, um, whenever I have a client about uh, choosing where they want to live, mm -hmm. um, I could tell them, I said, um, I'll give them a couple of resources to kind of look at. And then I also say it's a dual thing. So you can kind of look at places to where you want to live. And then I'll do some research on my own to see what we have uh, to see what's available out there too, as well. Mm -hmm. And then, <clears throat> so if I find it, I said, and I ask them, I ask them, have they found a place? And then they'll tell me no. And then I'll let them know that I found a couple of places and um, we'll go look at the places. And then they wind up choosing those places after we, you know, do the walkthrough. Mm -hmm. um, is that, is that, basically them choosing it that is them choosing here's what i would would say to make that a little bit better because i like what you're doing thomas i like that you're asking them to look as well and it's fine if they can do that what i would say is you know how many place or you know what is realistic for you can you can you can you, if you're walking around, can you, you know, if I give you a pen and a piece of paper, can you write down places that you see that you might want to think about moving to? But getting a little bit more specific, like, okay, so I'm going to look for some places for you to move to. I'm going to try to find at least two places for you to look at. Can you, do you think you could find two places that you might be interested in moving to? Giving them a number, giving them a goal to reach is, 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 might be the next step that you want to do. Okay. And, and that way, the next time you see them, you've had, you have your two places and hopefully they have their two places. If they say, no, I couldn't find any place. Sometimes I might say, well, were you looking or did you just not see any signs up or where were you looking? Because we, we, 
you're on the right track, Thomas, by engaging them in the process. We want to engage people in the process as much as possible because engaging them in the process keeps them interested and keeps them there with you. Like if they see movement, so say we have this meeting and the next meeting I have two places, they know I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. They know I'm, I'm there and they see movement. If they haven't found two places, I wanna check and see why they didn't look because it might be a sign that they don't, they don't know how to look or it might be that they didn't look at all and they just wanted you to do all the work. If, if that's the case, I want to try to work a little bit harder to get them involved because the more I could get them involved, the more that when they do get a place, they're gonna be invested in that place. So that involvement is key to people being successful. Some people don't have the ability. I've, I've met people who were 60 years old and could not read and write. So I, I don't assume and I don't want to give uh, people goals that they can't make or they can't meet. If I have somebody who can't read and write, I'm not going to say, find, help me find your place. Or let's, but I, what I may say to them is, okay, I'm going to give you some pictures of places and I want you to just take a look at these pictures and you can, and next time we talk, I want you to tell me what you like about these pictures and, or what do you like about these places? What don't you like about these places? Getting them involved somehow makes a difference. And it also helps them to stay motivated to continue working on this because sometimes finding a place like somebody said yesterday doesn't happen overnight and you need to keep them engaged because that it, it, people lose hope. They, they, they come into this program hoping that they're going to get a place to live. And now it's been two months. They haven't heard anything. They don't know what's going on. They lose interest. Or they go, this is just another one of those promise you the, a house and you never get anything programs. You got to think about ways to keep them engaged, ways for them to see movement. Even if it's slow movement, you want to let them know what's going on to keep them there, to keep them coming back to the next visit. So questions about that. I'm going to go over this and then I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to let uh, Kimberly and or Kimberly and Ray Ann or or one of them talk about some of the upcoming things. So a fidelity review consists of a lot of things. One, we send out an agenda to the agency to let them know that we're going to be doing a fidelity review and what's going to be a part of that fidelity review. We also sometimes ask them to send us some information before we come in for the review. That, that Excel spreadsheet is an example of some of the information agencies can send us. So we can do some of the work, prep work before we get there. Um, we do interviewing of all the different staff. So we will ask the agency to set up interviews and we'll tell the agency who we need to talk to and let them set that up. We also do observation. Sometimes if we have time, we might want to observe the housing specialist out talking to a landlord. We also want to observe the housing team in a meeting with each other to see, you know, are you having these meetings on a regular basis? Are, do you have a plan for if one person is going to be out on vacation, who's going to take over their caseload while they're on vacation? Uh, are, are you all talking to each other? Are you all working together to make sure this program is consistent? 
The next thing we also do is we do consensus scoring. Consensus scoring means we all sit there together and go through all of the information and we score it together. Now, when there's, when there's <laughs> discrepancy, say I want to give a place a four, but Colette says, uh-uh, oh no, what I found this place, I would go with a one. And we cannot agree on what this score should be. We need to go back and look at that score sheet that I showed you earlier where it has on there, what gives you a four, what gives you a one, and look at which one do they meet. And Colette might say, well, they didn't have this. And I'll say, well, but no, I got this from these people. We need to, we all need to be on the same page. And so Colette might not be, might not have all the information I have. Or Colette might have found something I didn't find and I need to know about that. And I might say, oh, well, now that makes this different. Maybe a four is not what they should get because you've identified some places where I, you know, the people I talk to that never came up. We all have to come to one score. If the score is not a four, the fidelity reviewers have an obligation to include some written information about what does that agency need to do to get to a four. And so say for instance, we go in and we say on choice, you get a 2.5 or whatever. I'm just, we need to explain to you why, what you need to do to get that four. So it might be you're only giving limited choice. So what we need you to do instead of just giving limited choice is to put all the choices on the table. So you might want to include a market rate apartment. You might want to have a subsidized apartment. You could also have uh, recovery housing. And there's lots of different recovery housing. There's more than just the Oxford house. There are other types of, of you know, housing out there. You might also have a permanent supportive housing facility that you work with. All of that should be on the table. And what we would say in our documentation is you're giving limited choice. This is why you got a 2.5 in order to improve. Here are some of the recommendations. Put all of these choices and we would list them out on, on, the, on the table and make, the, make sure you're talking to all of the participants about all of their choices. So that team can now go back and decide if they want to make changes and they want to take that score up to a four. They know what they need to do. So we make these recommendations. We give out this report. Then we ask the agency to develop an action plan. Um, you know, maybe they pick out two or three areas that they want to work on to improve. That's what we, that's a fidelity review from the beginning to the end is get, starting off with planning for it, letting them know it's coming, getting them to help us set up the agenda and the interviews, all going to the agency, doing everything we need to do, coming back, sitting down, doing our scoring, our consensus scoring. And then we each take parts to write up. So the team writes the, should be writing the final report and then giving it back to the agency and also making ourselves available if the agency says, I don't understand something or I think you gave us the wrong score. We need to be able to go back and explain why we gave the score we gave. Questions, thoughts? Was this helpful? 
do all of you feel like you got a lot of work to do? <laughs> I, but you know, the good thing is knowing that you have the work to do and, and being able to go back to do it. This is, you have to look at this as we're, we're trying to enable you to consistently get better. Sometimes you have to take a hard look at yourself in order to know where you need to improve. So we want to see that continuous improvement. And the only way you can do continuous improvement is to really objectively look at your program and see where you can improve and where you where you're not doing so well. I'm done, Ray Ann or Kimberly. I know you wanted to do an announcement. So you ready? Yep. Thanks, Pat. So did want to say thank you to Pat. Um, we love these Fidelity Reviewers trainings. You know, we get a lot of different folks in here. Some are new, some are a little bit experienced, but I think we always walk away learning something new um, or, or learning more about how to look at our program. So thank you, Pat. We appreciate your knowledge in this and sharing it with us. Um, you know, we wanted to talk about a couple different things. For one, we're getting ready to contract for new Fidelity reviews this coming fiscal cycle. So starting July 1, um, we will start be looking, we will be looking for agencies who want to participate in this learning collaborative, meaning that you can either post a fidelity review at your agency and allow us to do a baseline or possibly a follow up if you've done this before. Um, and, and or you can participate as a fidelity reviewer. Now that you've gone through the training, you're eligible to come and participate as a reviewer with Rayanne and I when we go out and do fidelity reviews at agencies um, across the state. So um, we will be contracting July 1 to do that. This year it's incentivized again as it was last year. Um, so there will be some money attached if you decide your agency wants to participate in either of those um, parts of Fidelity. So we're really looking forward to hearing from some of you that may want to do that. You know, doing this uh, training is great. You learn so much. And then also once you get out there and participate in some reviews and see how other agencies are doing it, you learn even more. So um, not only do you learn from other agencies what they're doing and maybe be able to take some of that back to your agency, but you can also share what you guys are doing and what works for you to help support that agency that we're reviewing. So it's a great way to network with other folks doing this work and also learn a thing or two from each other, which is what we really hope to do along the way is always learn our and grow our knowledge and fidelity. Well, and I remember when Kimberly, when Kimberly had her first uh, fidelity review um, and and they were like scrambling and going okay okay now we know now we know for the next time but then when they went out to do a fidelity review of another agency they were like oh I love this form can I have this form I want to steal this form and then they also got to hear what the other agencies were doing and they were like that's a streamlined approach that we could steal some of that. Mm -hmm. it, it, it really does help to be able to see different, how different agencies tackle different issues. And sometimes you learn a better way or you see it differently and you go, oh, well, that makes total sense. And that would be easier than the convoluted way we're doing it. Absolutely. Learn so much. In fact, the first year I did a Fidelity review, Pat was there. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we really thought that we were Fidelity rock stars, right? We went in thinking we were going to rock this review. And then as we went in and got, you know, got some recommendations, we were like, oh, okay, so there is some room for improvement. And we really, you know, I still learn things all the time being out with agencies. And I do still, I do still forms. If you guys allow me, if I like something, I will ask for it. I still do that and share it with everyone mm -hmm. across the state. So um, it's really a fun process. We try to make it fun. It's not an audit. It's really about learning and improving our, upon the services we're providing folks. And so we really encourage you guys, if you're interested in participating, to reach out to Rayanne and I so that we can get that um, moving forward and get you part of that process this year. Also, we are getting ready to send out through our gut delivery list and through Amerigroup a Fidelity Reviewer or survey 
And we really want folks to take a few minutes to fill this survey out. This is gonna give us some guidance on why or why not agencies are participating in fidelity reviews. What helps you guys do that? Um, if there are barriers to being able to participate as an agency. So this survey is gonna help us just really be able to focus in on why agencies may not be able to do these things with us. And also why some agencies do find it um, good to do and how they're how they're going about it so please please take a few minutes when you see that tomorrow um to take a few minutes to fill that out i think we're giving you a few weeks to get that back to us um, we'd be happy to answer any questions around that survey if you have any but really hoping we can get as many people as possible to fill that out whether you've participated or not so if this is your first really anything around fidelity fill it out because that's going to be helpful for us as well um in knowing what you know what that looks like for you as an agency. Um, it does, you don't have to be just leaders. We want direct service staff, your leadership, and everyone kind of in between to help to fill out and get us that, that information. So those are a couple things that are going on. Really just want to thank you guys for participating in the fidelity review process um, and learning how to be a reviewer. We look forward to working with you guys. Also know that Rayanne and I are available um as your trainers to provide any support around anything we talked about today our job is to help support you guys in implementing supportive housing services and to help you in you know all those things that we've talked about today whether it's policy whether it's um just processes or forms or how to how to give choice all of those things are part of what we do and so please utilize us to support you if that's something you guys want to do we can do one-on-one -on -one, we can do agency training um, just let us know how we can do that. Rayanne is our East Side trainer and I focus on Western Washington and we'll make sure you guys have all of the, the slide deck and the, the forms that Pat shared today. And then of course, Rayanne and I's contact if you wanna reach out and do some further training or discussion. So thank you guys. I hope you all have a wonderful week. Thank you, Pat, for always being wonderful and uh, sharing your knowledge of Fidelity. Um, Pat taught me everything I know about Fidelity. so. You guys are getting it from from somebody that's been doing it a really long time and um please please uh let us know how we can support you moving forward yeah and and really reach out to rayanne and kimberly they have a lot of knowledge and and if they get stuck they know where to go so you and and trust me you're probably not the only one dealing with whatever it is you whatever it is that you're dealing with another agency is probably dealing with it as well so it also helps to know that you have resources and you have people there to help you so i want to thank you all i i will make sure you get the slides i will also make sure that all of the documentation that i've talked about you get that you get and I also will ask Kimberly and Rayanne to make sure they include the pathways information because I I highly recommend the pathways um, site because it has a lot of those forms on there and you might find forms that you think oh man this is an easy way to do this I'm still in it that's what it's for that's right. We're actually updating Pathways to Housing, so there's going to be some huge enhancements. Uh, beginning of the year, you'll see that it's um, got a, quite a few new pages and resources added to it. So it'll be even um, more improved at the beginning of the year, but we definitely want people to utilize that and have that on their favorites as a resource for yourself and your participants. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I hope this was helpful and you have a great day. Thanks, everyone. And take care. Take care, thank you.